Shalom and welcome to another time of Israel's Hope Bible Church Online. My name is Ron Grossman. We're continuing our studies in the book of Acts. This um, particular um, lesson is for the 9th of June, 2021. We're going to be in Acts chapter 23, verses 1 to 11 today. Let's stop, let's pray, and ask the Holy Spirit to direct us. Father God, we thank you for everyone looking in now. We ask that those looking in live and those who will look in later on our YouTube channel may uh, be encouraged by these things that we talk about today. And we ask now your blessing and pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Follow with me, please, as we read, starting at verse 1 of Acts 23. It says this, And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that they stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul to him, God shall smite thee, thou white, white, whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And they that stood by said, Revilest thou with the king's, thy, God's high priest? Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that I was he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. But then Paul, when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and, of, and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. And when he had said so, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. But there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part rose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great uh, dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and bring him unto the castle. And the night following... The Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Well, to strive um, for the uh, to strive for the Lord, as the old English says, and to do the things of God sometimes will cost. There will be a price. The title of this message is God's Purpose Revealed. That the context of time and place that got us to here was Paul's decision way back when he was in Asia uh, to go uh, back to Jerusalem, even though he was told not to. And it, in a particular portion, I believe it's Acts 17, it says that he came to this conclusion in the spirit. And the word spirit there is small s. So that means it wasn't Paul, the Holy Spirit that Paul was uh, listening to. Agabus, a uh, uh, prophet of God, uh, took Paul's belt when they were staying overnight and said to him, he said, the man owns this belt, this is what will happen to him in Jerusalem, and this is what's been happening here. Paul had gone into the temple. There they uh, said that here's the man who tells Jewish people everywhere to stop keeping the law, and a, a riot broke out. The pre Roman centurion sent down the forces to uh, put an end to the riot. Paul spoke to his people of the house of Israel, and he said that he was there and uh, why he was there, he was there to pay a, a vow, an Azrite vow for four Jewish men of, the, uh, of those who were called of the way. All to prove to those of the house of Israel that I, Paul, am still Jewish. But they didn't see him that way. And it's not a matter whether Paul was Jewish or not. It was the fact that he was a follower of that way. He was a follower of the Messiah. And this brought uh, just a complete uh, division amongst the people of the house of Israel. And we see it here in this portion as well. From the priesthood on down, there was division amongst the people of the house of Israel about who Jesus the Messiah was. Well, let's take a look at this portion and let's see what it tells us about uh, all these things as we now set the context of time. Well, he is brought into the council as he asked to speak to his own people. And he said this in verse uh, tw verse 1, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. In other words, to hit him on the mouth. It's a, uh, literally to shut his mouth down. They were so hard-hearted towards anything to do with the gospel that even Paul standing up and saying, I have done my best to live with a good conscience before God until this day. And that they couldn't even 
be accepting of. So they, uh, Ananias, who was the, uh, the high priest at the time, said, hit him in the mouth. Paul then looked at him and said, you should smite me, you whited wall, for you sit to judge me after the law and command me to be smitten contrary to the law. He pointed out to him, he said, look, I know the law just as you do. And we'll see a, a hint to that later on. And uh, you're going to do this to me, and you're supposed to be the ones upholding the law? And then in verse 4, they said to him, you revile God's high priest? Now think about this for a moment. Here was the high priest who was saying to those around him, hit him. And Paul says, you'll break the law. And these were the people who were supposed to be upholding the law. And they said to him, you would revile God's high priest? Now, look at Paul answers. I wist not, brethren. I did not know, is what the old English means there, that he was the high priest. For it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Paul, when he found this out, took back his words, it would seem. You whited wall, which means that you're just a whitewashed nobody. And uh, you shall not speak ill of the ruler of the people, because he realized, I better be prepared to keep the law and to be an example of this, even when I accuse others of, of breaking the law. But as this all happened, Paul then re uh, perceived what he probably already knew. Since he was a Pharisee himself, he would have been of the Sanhedrin. Now remember, he describes himself as a Pharisee in the book of Philippians chapter 3. So he would know the divisions within the Sanhedrin, the high priesthood of Israel. Some are Sadducees who have no place for the resurrection, and some are Pharisees like him. And this is where he gets the upper hand, you might say. He says to them, he says, men and brethren, verse 6, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead. I am called in question. In other words, you are uh, questioning me or you're judging me for what I hold to as according to the law. Now, if the Pharisees and Sadducees shared the Sanhedrin, what would they do when they found out that the one before them knew enough to say who it was that he, and what it was that he believed? So you see, it goes on and explains the Sadducees, verse 8, um, after dissension breaks up between the two, the multitude was divided. In verse 8, it explains why. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection. Neither an angel nor a spirit, but the, Phari the, the Pharisees confess both. The Pharisees, in their theology, were more biblical than the Sadducees. The Sadducees were politically motivated individuals who held the, uh, the sway of the Sanhedrin. They may not have been the majority of Israel at this time, but they held the sway. In other words, they controlled the religious council of Israel. So what happens from all of this is a great cry goes up amongst the scribes or the Pharisees, part rose and strove. That, that old word there, strove, means they protested, saying, we find no evil in this man. So you see, what Paul has done is, in order to get the heat off, in, in a sense, what he has done, he has said, I know who's here. I, this is who I am. And he gets the support. He divides the Sanhedrin amongst their own, you might say, religious, political grounds and lines. And he gets these people to say, there's nothing evil about that man. And then they go on to say, if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, latter part of verse 9, let us not fight against God. That will take us all the way back to Acts chapter 5, verses 38 and 39. This is where Gamaliel, who was of the priesthood of Israel, at the time where Peter and John were brought in and told, do not speak in this name any longer. This one maybe would be about maybe 10, 15 years earlier. Do not speak of this in this man, this name of this man any early, anymore. That would have been Jesus the Messiah. And they put him out and they discussed, uh, Peter and John at least, they put him out of the same Sanhedrin and someone st spoke up and his name was Gamaliel. A Pharisee a Talmudic uh, priest of Israel at the time and would have uh, is still revered today in Israel because the Pharisees retained control 
of Judaism as it evolved after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. I'll explain that in a minute. It has impact upon what, uh, what we're discussing here. So a great dissension, division, broke, up, broke, uh, broke out, and we find, let's not fight against God. Is this, these were the words of Gamaliel back in Acts chapter 5. So you see, Paul has very purposely seen to break apart the, uh, the arguments that are being made here and to, against him and to get them to argue amongst themselves and to get support from within the Sanhedrin. He knew enough to find the support of those who believed as he believed. The only thing different about what Paul believes here and the other Pharisees of the Sanhedrin is that Paul believes that he is a follower of Jesus, or not so much that, is that he believes in Jesus. Why? Because he experienced Jesus. He saw him, Acts chapter 22, verse 14, where Jesus confers, basically confers upon him his apostolic credentials, because he allowed Paul to see him on the road to Damascus. All that to say that it was the Pharisees who defended the um, resurrection, that there are angelic beings, that um, there are spirit beings, there is a spirit wor world, that they were allowed to leave Jerusalem in the summer of 70 AD, when the Romans had laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. Many of the Pharisees, realizing it was a lost cause, went out and saw Titus out, out outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem and said, look, we have no fight with you. We just want to preserve our religious way of life. I'm paraphrasing it. You can find it all in Josephus. We just want to go up the coast here to a small village called Yavne and, and just work to preserve our, our Judaism, which eventually evolved into the Judaism that we live under today if you are a part of the rabbinical way of worshiping God. If you're a Hebrew, a Jewish person who attends synagogue, it had its start in 70 AD when a small contingent of priests out of Israel, realizing the end was near, the temple would be destroyed and everything would come tumbling down, they were allowed to leave and they preserved the Judaism that evolved post-Second Temple period. And that continues until today. And it continues in such a way that they continue to deny Jesus as Messiah. Now, we'll make a connection back to this in a moment because I want to finish the passage. Verse 10, in this great dissension here, the chief captain, this would be of the, uh, the centurion who had brought him in, the, uh, the Roman guards, seeing that Paul would, might be pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the castle, the Antonio, Antonia Fortress, where he was kept. The following night, it says in verse 11, the Lord stood by him and said this, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Now Paul went back, and this, this is the crux of the story here. Paul went back to Jerusalem in his own spirit. And some people have said over the years, and they're not entirely wrong, that when he went back, he went back disobedient. And what would God do? Well, I, I think that what God is going to do here, as we're going to see, and this is the, the turning point here in verse 11 of Acts 23, is that God will intervene just like he intervened with Jonah in the belly of the great fish. He put him in that great fish, Jonah, to get him rerouted to the place that he wanted him to be. Now, Paul purposed in his spirit to go to Jerusalem. And many said, don't do it. Don't go. And we're going to see later in the latter part of chapter 23 here why he should not have gone and the danger it would have brought to him. It, went, it took him away from where God really wanted him to go. Now, remember the prophet Jonah. He was given a message of God. Go to Nineveh, tell them to repent. What did Jonah do? Got on a boat and went in the opposite direction. What happened? 
what happened was a great storm came. And when in the tradition of the pagans of that day said, who brought this calamity on us? And Jonah said, I did. And they threw him overboard and it stopped. And Jonah was swallowed by that whale and spit up on the shore and then he went to Nineveh. Read the book of Jonah and you'll see. The reluctant prophet who finally went. God's purpose had to be revealed through a great fish. God's purpose here has to be revealed through Roman centurions intervening, the priesthood of Israel in division and arguing amongst themselves so that the, the centurions can again intervene and rescue Paul out of it. And what does God tell Paul later that night? Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me here in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. You see, God can take what man does that is wrong and use it for the good, for the saving of many souls. The scriptures speak to that. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. When Joseph and his brothers uh, were sitting together after they had come back from burying Jacob in, uh, back in the land, his brothers thinking that now he's going to get even with us because our father isn't around, go to him and say, our dad said, don't do anything bad to us. But Joseph perceived what it was all about. And Joseph looked at them and said, what you did was evil, but God can take the evil and use it for the saving of many souls. And it did. It saved the 70 souls of the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who had gone down into Egypt and would result in 2 million plus going home in the Exodus about 400 years later. And it would result in Moses receiving the law and taking the people to the edge of the land, giving the responsibility to Joshua, who took them into the land and conquered the land, the very land that God promised to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob forever. All the promise, all tied up in the writings and the prophets and the law of Moses. So to that end, we come to this place now where we're going to see what God is going to do with uh, Paul and how that will end up in the coming days. We teach these things of the scriptures in order for you and others to be able to be encouraged so that perhaps one Jewish person may look in today and hear this message and realize God has got a future for me and the people of the house of Israel. So we thank God for all these things and ask you to pray with us as we do serve him in this teaching ministry. If you'd like to support this ministry, if you're looking in from the United States, we would deeply appreciate that support. You can pray for us. If you feel led of the Lord to give a gift to this ministry, you can. By sending a check in the USA for the support of the work in Canada, send it to I Hope USA, 2330 Norton Lane, North Bloomfield, Ohio, 44450. Make out the check to I Hope USA. Put on the memo line of the check, Grossman's Support Canada. If you live in Canada or elsewhere in the world and you'd like to give a gift to the, to the work of Israel's Hope, we ask you to go to our webpage, www.ihopecanada.org. There you will find uh, you can give a, a gift by a, an e-transfer. It's only available in Canada. Or you can give a gift uh, through our PayPal account, simply clicking on the PayPal icon on our webpage, or you can send a check in the mail. You'll find our Canadian address there, which is uh, in Ottawa, Canada. All the information is there. Just go to our webpage, www.ihopecanada.org. Thank you again for looking in. Thank you for your prayer and support of this ministry. Let's close our time in prayer. Father God, thank you for everyone who has been with us today. We pray that your word not come back empty, void. We ask now that you would uh, receive all the glory and honor from what is being taught here. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So until next time, we say, Shalom.